Well, um, thank you, David, for a very handsome, um, ambivalent introduction. Um, I uh, still feel that I must begin by striking um, a, a slightly solemn chord. I hope it won't seem like a sententious one. I mean, if you have our, not just our geographical position on this coast, but uh, in view of the fact that our society has recently both asked for and required the solidarity of so many other societies, I would like us to keep quiet for a moment and think about our Australian brothers and sisters and the obscene atrocity to which they've been subjected, and also to think about the root causes of that atrocity, which are uh, the determination of some people not to coexist with civil society and also the willingness of Australian soldiers to volunteer for the unhappy and belated, but ultimately delightful, independence of East Timor, um, an independence that was greeted by the Bin Ladenists and their allies as a crime against uh, one of their favorite dictatorships. So with that said, I would just in entreat a moment of uh, reflection. Thank you. And also of solidarity, in case um, there should be any antipodean listeners to this show. I say show, even though it's me doing it. So, um, I thought I might begin by reading a poem, uh, which is the, the uh, introduction of my book on George Orwell. It's written by Robert Conquest, a distinguished local resident, a professor at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Um, Orwell only lived to be 46. Uh, I went to Bob Conquest's 85th birthday last year and was amazed, um, as I say in my dedication to him, to be in the presence of such a great scholar and such a great man who has the rare quality of having been both a, a premature anti-fascist and a premature anti-Stalinist. Uh, a combination seldom met with in the same person, as well as a, a wonderful poet, a great critic, um, perhaps the great historian of the atrocities of the 20th century, and the man who has done the most, along with Philip Larkin and Kingsley Amis in the last few decades, to keep the very difficult and intricate form of the limerick alive. <laughs> Any one of these attainments, I think, might be enough for one lifetime. He, some years ago, wrote a poem about George Orwell, and to my boundless gratitude, gave me permission to use it. And I'm going to uh, requite that gratitude by, um, as people sometimes say in this area, sharing it with you. Um, moral and mental glaciers, melting slightly, betray the influence of his warm intent. Because he taught us what the actual meant, the vicious winter grips its prey less tightly. Not all were grateful for his help, one finds, for how they hated him, who huddled with the comfort of a quick remedial myth against the cold world and their colder minds. We die of words. For touchstones he restored, the real person, real event or thing. And thus we see not war, but suffering as the conjunction to be most abhorred. He shared with the great world for greater ends that honesty, a curious cunning virtue you share with just the few who don't desert you. A dozen writers, half a dozen friends. A moral genius and truth seeking brings sometimes a silliness we view askance. Like Darwin playing his bassoon to plants, he too had lapses, but he claimed no wings. While those who drown a truth's empiric part in dithyramb or dogma turn frenetic than whom no writer could be less poetic, he left this lesson for all verse, all art. If, in what I'm about to say, I can arise to anything like that standard of evocation, um, I shall be pleased to myself, and I, I hope you'll be pleased with uh, my subject. Um, I'm going to choose to begin in this way, and I hope not to be thought opportunistic. Uh, but in the last uh, seven days, We've been reminded very forcibly indeed, it seems to me, that the totalitarian principle, that's to say, the principle which enslaves one society 
the better to commit an aggression against others, uh, is not something that we can confine to the perhaps compulsory study of 1984 and of Animal Farm, which is visited on school children in this country, but is a living, vivid, actual principle and a, a really clarifying threat. I'm referring first to the unspeakable degradation that was inflicted last week by their big brother on the people of Iraq, uh, forced once again to gather adoringly, uh, unanimously and terrified, and not only to turn out to vote 100 percent, but to turn out to vote 100 percent the same way. After what they've been through, one felt they might have been spared this last Ceausescu style. Uh, abnegation, humiliation. And second, the discovery that the People's Republic of North Korea has all this time while its people have been starving and screaming with hunger and pain and the absence of all culture uh, has been choosing to spend all its resources on the enrichment of uranium. Uh, who will say in the face of this that the relevance of George Orwell belongs in the past? It so happens that I've been to both Iraq and North Korea. I'm up to speed um, on the Axis stuff, have been for some time. Now that in my book, I write about uh, my visit to Pyongyang in this way. In the closing months of the 20th century, I contrived to get a visa for North Korea, often referred to as the world's last Stalinist state. It might as easily be described as the world's prototype Stalinist state founded under the protection of Stalin and Mao, and made even more hermetic and insular by the fact of a partitioned peninsula that, so to speak, locked it in, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea still boasted the following features at the end of the year 2000. On every public building, a huge picture of the great leader, Kim Il-sung, the dead man who still holds the office of president in what one might therefore term a necrocracy. <laughs> or a morsalocracy. All other senior posts are occupied by his son, the dear leader, Kim Jong-il. After all, big brother, as a term, was a perversion of family values as well. Children march to school in formation, singing songs in praise of the aforesaid leader. Photographs of the leader displayed by order in every home. A lapel button with the features of the leader, compulsory wear for all citizens. Loudspeakers and radios blasting continuous propaganda for the leader and the party. A, a society endlessly mobilized for war, its propaganda both hysterical and, in reference to foreigners and foreign powers, intensely chauvinistic and xenophobic. Complete prohibition of any news from outside or any contact with any other countries. Absolute insistence in all books and all publications on a unanimous view of a grim past, a struggling present, and a radiant future. Repeated bulletins of absolutely false news, of successful missile tests or magnificent production targets. A pervasive atmosphere of scarcity and hunger, alleviated only by the most abysmal and limited food. Grandiose and oppressive architecture. A continuous stress on mass sports and mass exercise. Apparently total repression of all matters connected to the libido. Newspapers with no news, shops with no goods, an airport with almost no planes a vast nexus of tunnels underneath the capital city, connecting different party and police and military bunkers. There was, of course, only one word for it, and it was employed by all journalists, all diplomats, and all overseas visitors. It's the only time in my writing life when I've become tired of the term Orwellian. I might add uh, here to interpolate, I, I was in Czechoslovakia under the old uh, communist police regime in the late 1980s, and I resolved while I was in Prague to become the first reporter to write a, an article from there, first writer to compose one that wouldn't mention the name Franz Kafka. <laughs>